Yes, um, and my name is Michael Higgins and I chair the Environment and Planning Committee for the Tasman District. Um, and I'm very pleased to pick up on your last point. Um, at the Council we have been looking at this issue with regard to livestock farming. Yeah. Um, many of us have a great deal of difficulty uh, in accepting that a cow or a sheep eating grass is causing such a problem. And because it's so natural, quite frankly. Um, and I'd be interested to hear your comments on, on the direction we're looking. We, we're looking at issues such as microbial effects in the soils and the accumulation of carbon in the soils. And we're looking at um, whether artificial fertilisers are in fact driving the livestock numbers and driving the methane. Because I accept it happens, sure. but I mean, I'm just trying to, we're, we're trying to figure out well, why, what is it that's unnatural and, and what can we turn around to make it natural and actually make it a positive instead of a negative. Okay, well, I, you know, that, that's a really good question. And, and just one thing I should say up front is that, um, mm. I'm quite sure if we said before, I grew up on a farm, I'm very sensitive, very, you know, I'm very aware of some of the issues for farmers. And I, get, I do get quite concerned about what seems like a kind of an urban-rural split over this. That, uh, you know, if I go along and talk in Wellington, people tend to think, you know, the farmers are these terrible people with horns out there producing greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> and if I talk to farmers, some of them tend to think that us scientists are horrible people, uh, you know, wandering around with beards and trying to make their lives difficult. And what we need to do is to be realistic and not just think it's a simple problem. So first of all, just to explain, the, the problem is that if you have a cow or a sheep, um, if it just ate grass and grew and died and, you know, sort of carbon dioxide went back into the atmosphere at the end of all of that, it wouldn't really be a problem because the grass would be taking carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the sheep would eat it, it would turn it into meat, uh, and then, you know, eventually it would finish up as carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere again, so it's just a natural cycle. The problem is that, cow, that cows and sheep eat, gra eat grass, which is used carbon dioxide to, to, to grow, but they turn it into methane. And kilogram for kilogram, methane is something like 35% as effective as a greenhouse gas is what carbon dioxide is. And it, it, it doesn't last as long as carbon dioxide, and that's part <coughs> of the issue that needs to be thought through in terms of international negotiations. But nevertheless, it does make a substantial impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So... Uh, you know, we didn't have the number of sheep, and uh, we didn't have any sheep or cows wandering around New Zealand a couple of hundred years ago. So they, they have actually produced more greenhouse gases, more methane, than what there were pre-industrial. So there's no question but that those agricultural things are putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Although, putting them in from grass-fed agriculture like in New Zealand, it's probably not as bad as growing uh, growing corn <laughs> and then feeding that to sheep in terms of the energy it takes to do that. So in terms of what can be done, there are various things. Um, I mean, you mentioned about fertilisers, and also there's nitrous oxide that comes from, uh, from, from urine and things like that. And there are these things called nitrification inhibitors, which people are looking at in terms of reducing that. There is this whole issue about whether you can do things which will build up the amount of carbon in the soil, which is essentially taking, essentially taking carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and putting more in the soil, which, which uh, I'm not an expert on that. I, I don't know the details, but it certainly sounds like a, you know, a good thing to be looking at. And then the other problem about, well, not really problem, but is um, cows and sheep turning grass into methane is actually rather inefficient. If you could get them to turn it into meat and milk instead, that would be quite good. So there, there is some, at least from some of the research people are doing, it does seem that not all animals, not all cows produce the same amount of methane. There may be ways of actually changing things so that they do make better use of that energy and don't produce so much methane. So there are a, a range of things that are being looked at, but there's no kind of like magic silver bullet that's going to solve everything tomorrow, I'm afraid. You know, I hope that over a period of decades there will be. I accept, I accept what you're saying. A lot yeah. of what you've said actually basically tells us the basics, which we all yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to quote 
uh, one, the, the, one of the best farms in Nelson, Wantworth, which is uh, the Shuttleworth farm, sure. 98 Valley. And when I was a young farmer, they had enough cash flow to do everything to best yeah. practice. Yeah. And they used all the fertilizers, yes. and he went a certain time, and he said, this is not working. Yeah. And he's turned it around, mm -hmm. and he's putting on microbial yeah. uh, fertilizers, and his soil depth is growing, sure. his carbon is growing. And I, I'm disturbed by your answer, because <coughs> as a scientist, you should know a great deal more about this. Because I, I, the evidence that we're seeing as a council is that we can accumulate a great deal of carbon, and I accept the methane carbon uh, multiplier, but the carbon buildup in the soil is massive, it's not minor. And as a council, we, we need to understand this, and I think scientists need to understand it as well. No, I agree with you that, uh, first of all, I wasn't saying building up carbon in the soil is a bad thing. I think it's a very good thing. Uh, in terms of the knowledge, <coughs> there, there are scientists in New Zealand that work in that area, that mainly in land care research, and I agree that actually being able to quantify what that build-up of carbon is and how it fits into the whole picture is very important. And I think that's an important thing for our international negotiations as well, so that we do understand that well, both in terms of how we negotiate what New Zealand's position should be in future, and also in terms of the sort of advice that goes to farmers about things they can do which will help. So, unfortunately, I can't be an expert on everything. Sort of carbon's not my own area. My own area is actually what's happening to the climate itself. But I agree with you that understanding that uh, being able to nail down what the actual numbers are, how much that might offset some of the some of the methane emissions is really important. And also, if that's something which farmers can do to actually help, then it's really important to get that information out as well. Any more questions? Oh Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Could we keep them succinct, please? I'll try to keep the answer short. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> questions, not statements, thank you. Really? Yes, go ahead. Sure. Um, the climate change deniers are alive and well, as you know, and Van der Lingen had a piece in the press the other day, yeah. in which they focus entirely on the noise in the system and ignore the signal. Um, <clears throat> so am I right in, in thinking that in terms of the glacial, interglacial cycle, yeah. we're 10,000 years past the maximum heat yeah. received from the sun, and we should be cooling towards uh, the next glaciation. In addition to which, sunspot activity is very low at the moment, which also re leads to reduced temperatures. So we should be going down, but in fact we're going up. And that, that's the. I, I think that well, yeah, and people use that to argue in both directions. First of all, if you look at the last thousand years or so, the paleoclimate information does seem to suggest things were cooling very slowly. But the rate at which temperatures have increased, particularly over the last 100 years, is, is much greater than that. Uh, in terms of, and some people are saying, well, maybe putting greenhouse gases in there is a good thing because it will stop us going to the next ice age. But my understanding, you can sort of work out when ice ages are going to be because they depend on various orbital parameters and things. And I think it's at least 30,000 years or so until the next one. Apparently, we're in a rather longer period than uh, than sometimes. So it's probably 80,000 to the maximum. Well, that's right. And so we'll basically, ups and downs on the way. Exactly. So. Uh, using this as an excuse to keep putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is definitely not a good idea. The whole issue about changes in energy coming from the sun and so on, there's been a lot of careful research on that. And what's come through from that very clearly is that if the Earth was as, as sensitive to very, very small changes in energy from the sun that we've had over the past, that we get across the solar cycle and we've had over the past few decades, then we should have actually been seeing much more impact from the greenhouse gases. And in fact, uh, over the last few decades, the temperatures change in the opposite direction from what you would have expected from the changes <laughs> in the sun. So I think that, quest that, that argument that it's all due to the sun, certainly some of the variability in the past has been due to the sun, but what we're getting to now is the situation where the extra greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere as humans are basically having much more effect than those small variations over the solar cycle or even over longer periods from the sun. <laughs>